I don't know why I didn't call this authors and artists. Would have been much better alliteration and authors and illustrators, but nevertheless. Um, just to answer the question from yesterday, I just looked up and it's uh, shotguns were mostly used for collecting birds and the uh, pellet size can be varied that you put into the cartridges and so one would use, they used much finer um, shot for smaller birds and larger for larger birds. So that's just to answer that question. Right, so if we look at an example of a species description, this one was by Linnaeus for the red-billed quellia, and he, even though he was Swedish, he wrote in the classic language at the time, Latin, and so that was the description, and that's the same for all his uh, uh, texts and species descriptions. So I just did a very rough translate with using Google Translate, but still, even if you read that, you can see things like, well, the beak is red, and uh, it's a heavy bird, etc. You get an idea of the bird, but it's nothing like having a picture of what the bird looks like. So Linnaeus didn't have any illustrations in his books, but he did often refer to, so not in this particular example, but often he would have a reference to where there was a painting that he had seen. And so as soon as you've got uh, an illustration, you just get a much better idea of what the bird looks like. And so that's why illustrations, especially with uh, birds and other animals and plants that are no, unknown uh, to people, it's really great having art. So right in the early days, the only way to reproduce uh, art for mass production, for books uh, to distribute, was with woodcuts or woodcut engravings. And you can see here that, uh, so the woodcut uh, is the, the simpler method, just uh, cutting a design into wood and then uh, using ink and that can be used as a stamp to uh, illustrate uh, pages of multiple copies. And in wood engravings, a similar idea but just with harder wood where you need engraving tools, you can't just use a simple knife. And of course, uh, cutting into wood like that, if you try it, you'll realize it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. And so, uh, so here's an example of some artwork using uh, woodcuts and yeah, you can see some of the animals what they are, but not the best for birds, especially birds that are very similar to each other. Um, so that, this is an illustration, the first one of the Madagascar Fodi, uh, when Flacourt, a French guy, visited Madagascar. Uh, but that's what the bird actually looks like. And you, know, you'd, you might think that this could have been just as well a sparrow or a dove or multiple other species. Peter, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yes. Yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, these are French. You know, if one looks at this here, yeah, definitely kind of like French names that he gave. Uh, but it's all interrelated, these names, because they're taken from some language and made into a Latin name, or, and a lot of it came into, through to the English language as well, of course. Uh, just another example, early German explorer in Cape Town, and he illustrated many birds that weren't formally described at the time. This is long before Linnaeus, um, but certainly uh, common birds like the spoonbill and ostrich and this long-tailed widow were already illustrated uh, and known in Europe, so some of the birds at least. Right, then in the 1700s, uh, copper plate etchings were invented and became uh, the, the way to do art. So even though it was a lot more work uh, to engrave in copper uh, and then etch it a bit deeper with nitric acid, use ink, and then a press uh, was used. So you put paper on top and press it down very hard and then color in uh, with watercolor paints normally uh, if you wanted to. And so that worked very well, even though it was very tedious. And so all the early artists like uh, Albin that I mentioned, um, and these are the two weavers that he illustrated, and Linnaeus described these two species based on this artwork. So 
Uh, Alban was mainly interested in insects and was, uh, has been described as the greatest uh, entomological book illustrator in his time, but he also did birds and other animals. And similarly, a bit later, George Edwards also used this copper engraving. Uh, Edwards is very distinctive in all his art that he enjoyed uh, putting many different species onto one page and try and have a natural setting, uh, you know, with flowers and grass and twigs and so on. And again, uh, so he did, uh, did his own, whoops, sorry, own sketch of the uh, painting of the um, black-breasted weaver, same as uh, um, Alban had done, and Linnaeus referred to both, the art, uh, both artists, uh, if you remember Monday's talk. Right, then uh, Francois Nicolas Martinet uh, was a very, very productive artist, and he painted more paintings than anyone else in his time, uh, especially birds. He did all the plates for uh, Brisson's book, and I think also a lot for Buffoon, um, both of whom I've mentioned before. And these were books of many volumes and many, many plates, hundreds. Uh, so he really worked hard um, to illustrate all those. Now, for these uh, engravers, often they did their own... So the engraving part was easy. That's to get the outline of the bird. But then every single page for each copy had to still be uh, painted uh, with watercolours individually. So one can even see in different copies small variations. I mean, they were pretty good and pretty uh, similar, but one can see uh, small variations in, in the actual colours of different copies of these books. And here's just uh, a whole um, library of some of the plates that Martinet had illustrated. These are all of the weavers. Of course, he did many other uh, species as well. And again, he also had an illustration of the black-breasted weaver down here, even though it had been illustrated several times before. Right, then Peter Brown was an English um, artist working in London. He did mainly flowers, but he also illustrated uh, these three weaver birds for the very first time that no one else had yet uh, painted. Right, in the 1800s, uh, lithography was invented, and this was using uh, limestone plates instead of copper. So that was a lot easier to uh, do your etching on the limestone. And then they also improved the ink uh, you, in, including bitumen that just made it more permanent and then the same idea putting a sheet of paper on top and then so first doing the sketching then putting your ink over it and then put a piece of paper on top and press it down with a very heavy press so that and then when you take off the page the ink has been transferred and then you repeat the process for as many copies as you like and then often, not always, but mostly, then that would be uh, coloured in again with watercolours. William John Swainson was actually the first person to use uh, lithography for bird illustrations, and after that, everyone else followed suit very quickly. He was also an ornithologist uh, and very interested in both painting and writing about the birds that he came across. Right, then George Henry Ford uh, was uh, in South Africa uh, initially, and that's where he met Andrew Smith, when Andrew Smith was director of the South African Museum. Uh, but later on, Ford went across to the British Museum, and Smith asked him to do all his illustrations of the um, birds he had collected in South Africa. And so... Um, even though Ford hadn't gone with him on his journeys, he had access to the specimens, uh, or most of them, and was able to paint the birds from that. He used, uh, he wasn't the first, but uh, he used chromolithography, so that's where they started using colours in the ink that was put on the paintings, and so you choose yellow for the yellow patches, and then the other colours in successive um, presses down. So a bit more complicated, a lot of care needed, but certainly it meant that you didn't have to uh, draw in each page on its own afterwards. <laughs> 
Then Joseph Wolf, and uh, he was a German artist, and, but he also moved to the British Museum and uh, did the illustrations, not bird illustrations for David Livingston, but also for many other people. So uh, scenery as well as birds, animals, and uh, anything else to do with natural history. He was very accurate in his work, also using chromolithography and lithography, and uh, considered one of the great pioneers of wildlife art. Then Kuhlemans was a Dutch uh, illustrator, and he uh, worked for incredibly, uh, oh, oh, he did artwork for incredibly large number of books, as well as some journals, IBIS, Journal of Ornithology, and so on. So he also, again, illustrated some of the weavers for the first time, often for when the species was being uh, described. Uh, the guys like Sclater and Shelley and so on would ask one of the artists to look at the specimen and paint it for the species description. So unlike Linnaeus and the very early guys who just had written it up, uh, it became fashionable to include a picture uh, with a new species description. didn't happen for every single species, but for a very large uh, part it did. Then Henrik uh, Grunwald, a Danish artist, and again, like all the others, um, he did a large number of birds and other paintings. Uh, George Shelley, who I'll mention a bit later as well in his massive volume, uh, did, um, contained all the artwork by Grunwald. So these guys all painted at least a few weavers, and here you can see the ones that Henrik did, uh, but they were the uh, main artists in Europe. And there were others as well, but for birds, um, it doesn't matter which group of birds, if you're interested in parrots uh, or fairy wrens or any other group, these guys, some, one of them would have done the paintings for the new species. So, right. Then, uh, so as I said, most of the paintings were done at the same time as a species was described. But there were a few species that just for one or other reason never got illustrated. Possibly there wasn't time, uh, an artist was busy with another project or something, so the author would still go and write up the species description and the uh, bird just wasn't illustrated. So the greatest interval, because uh, when I did this uh, web series on each weaver bird species, I looked at I searched the literature for the first illustration, and it was easy enough to get the date from that and when the species was described. And so in most cases, it's very close together or even on the same um, uh, article. But the Seychelles Fodi, for some reason, just was never illustrated till nearly 100 years after it had been described. And then the very first illustration anyway, anyway was only of the beak, so of no great help. But then the, that was 19... 60, and then two years later, there was this illustration. And then soon after that, of course, it was illustrated in many different ways, uh, field guides, uh, and so on. These are my own photographs from uh, visiting the Seychelles, a male and a female Se Seychelles folding. Bit less brightly colored than many weavers, but the male still has a bit of yellow on the head. Right, so that was just a very quick overview of some of the most important artists. And now I want to talk about some of the African bird handbooks. So of course people were describing species mainly in uh, journal articles, newspaper articles right in the early days of Andrew Smith. Um, but these books uh, you know, set the, the basis for ornithology in Africa. And I'll talk about each one of these illustrated here in chronological sequence. Um, starting with uh, Shelley. So George Shelley, based in England, is the first person ever to have put together all the birds uh, of Africa into a single set of volumes. Uh, before him, many people like um, that I mentioned, Brison and Buffon, tried doing that for all the birds in the world on a global scale, everything that was known, but this is the first time it was, uh, the focus was on just the birds of Africa, because now the number of birds had increased to, to such a large extent. 
So the idea was not that new birds were being described, but it was more a case of summarizing everything that was known. And uh, so you can see here, uh, at this time, uh, where, uh, so, whoops, sorry, it's, um, it, over this time period, five volumes were published. The weavers appeared in the volume of 1905, and at that stage, 102 weaver bird species were known, so still quite a few to be discovered, uh, and he did not put in any new ones in this publication, although he had described some um, previously. The interesting thing also about Shelley is that for every single species of bird in his volumes, he included an English name, and that's the first time that that had happened. Some authors previously in even journal articles had occasionally included uh, an English or French or German name in a formal description but it was all very much Latin. Uh, but now, for the first time, he had chosen names for every single bird in these volumes, uh, English name, in addition to the scientific name, which was already established. And in a lot of cases, the names are exactly the same as uh, the, the names today. So it's just some examples of the weavers over there. Others are very similar. So if you look at a modern field guide, you'd be able to figure out well, this is now called just slender bold, uh, sorry, wango weaver, or this one's the northern brown-throated weaver, olive-headed weaver. So you can, if you look at a field guide, you can figure out uh, what was referred to there. But then there were also some names, that, and the, the names have changed completely since uh, 100 odd years ago. So, and you would be hard pressed to uh, find what he meant without looking at the Latin name. Uh, if you just compare these names along here. So here, I'll just talk a bit about one species, the alien weaver, uh, which is today called the strange weaver uh, from Rwanda and Uganda. And it had been uh, found by uh, Geoffrey Archer, an English ornithologist, and he sent it to England where uh, Richard Sharp described it. And his aunt was... Um, uh, I'll come to, to that in a moment. So when Sharp looked at the specimen, uh, at that stage they had called, now it's Plosius, but they had called these weavers uh, hyphen turgus uh, weavers, so that's a genus that's no longer used, and there was a group called Cetagra weavers. And these are just Greek names that basically mean weaver uh, in different forms. And he couldn't quite fit in where this belonged. Uh, so at this stage people like Shelley and Sharp uh, already had very nice classifications of what the different birds, uh, which groups they should belong to. And this one just had more black on the head than these, uh, but in habits it was similar, more similar to the, this group. In the end he did put it into this group, but we suspect, he didn't say it directly, or actually he did hint at it in a later publication that this weaver didn't fit in, and so the assumption is that's why he called it the, the alien weaver. It just didn't quite fit in there properly. And, and so uh, called strange weaver. So, but the person that had collected it, Jeffrey, his aunt, uh, her name was Aileen Jackson, and so there are people who say, well, maybe uh, this... Uh, um, uh, the, the Latin name that was given is a anagram for his aunt Aline. But in those days, people did give uh, anagram names, uh, converting them to Latin names, but they were always very strictly anagrams. And this one certainly isn't, because there's the missing A. So I don't think that he was trying to name it indirectly after uh, Jeffrey's aunt, but who knows. Right, then in Germany, Anton Reichenau uh, also uh, compiled a great uh, um, handbook series on, on the birds of Africa in four volumes. And he actually described a new species, uh, I guess a few others as well, but one new weaver bird species, the uh, black chinned weaver, which I spoke a bit about yesterday. Uh, he only included 90 weavers, so that's slightly less than Shelley had. Uh, Shelley was 102 or 101, and that's just because he considered uh, some of the uh, species to be the same, and so he lumped them. He uh, 
described 10 weavers that not in these volumes, previously in separate uh, papers. Uh, so he described one more than Linnaeus, who had uh, described nine. So from a weaver perspective, one of the most important authors. Uh, he was also very interested in uh, reptiles. And his uncle, uh, Cabanus, was also a very famous ornithologist, also had worked at the Humboldt Museum. He did visit Africa, unlike a lot of the other uh, authors, um, or museum workers, rather, uh, working in Europe. So he did have some field experience of African birds. And um, of course, he also had access to large collections coming his way that he could study. These are the 10 weaver bird species that he described. And these are just weavers from all over Africa, some um, uncommon species, bobtailed weaver, and, and so on. I'll talk a bit about the uh, rufous-tailed weaver that he described. It's, it was collected by Gustav Fischer. And Fischer was, uh, his aim when he came to uh, Africa was to find the, the quickest and best route from the coast to Lake Victoria. Uh, so he was exploring East Africa just after Speak had discovered uh, Lake Victoria. Now, the interesting thing about this species, though, if you notice here, it's got a uh, bluish eye. And you can also see that very nicely in these photos. It's the only weaver that's got a, this bluish uh, eye color, even though juveniles have brown eyes. Um, we don't know why it's got that uh, eye color. Most weavers have got either uh, pale whitish eyes, or as can be seen on this side, these are just South African examples, but in East Africa and West Africa as well, there are many weavers with, uh, where the males have got pale eyes, and then also red. So white and red eye color is very common in the weaver bird family. And it's thought to be uh, a signaling function where uh, a colleague, Adrian Craig, he analyzed all this and said that, in general, you know, the, the eye color contrasts with the face color, so the white against the black or even yellow, and the same here. In this photo, it's just not very clear uh, from the lighting that that's a red eye. So sometimes the females have brown eyes and sometimes the same color as the male. That just varies uh, quite largely. Um, but so that blue eye color could also be with signaling, but it certainly is just very unusual how that's developed. Right, then in 1930, um, William Sclater uh, did a set of two volumes. It wasn't, so the previous authors had all included a bit of biology about the birds, whatever was known, usually just quoting different uh, other authors, but putting it together for each species from different sources. Uh, whereas Sclater was only interested in the taxonomy of African birds, and or maybe sub-Saharan. I'm not too sure if he went uh, included the North African species. But uh, so it was very much just uh, the, the species with the different subspecies, how he considered it all to fit together. He included 108 species, uh, so a few more had been described by now, didn't include any new ones, and, and he hadn't uh, described any uh, new weavers uh, previously anyway. All right, then possibly what could be called the first African field guide is by Macworth Prade and his uh, colleague uh, Grant, and they did a set of um, two volumes for each of the three regions of Africa. So the, uh, this is for the southern third, and they also did uh, Western Africa and, and as well as Eastern Africa, just not shown here. And so there's a lot of overlap, uh, some species occurring in, in all three of the books uh, or sets, but uh, altogether they covered 101 species of weaver bird. And again, a bit less than Sclater, but that's, uh, uh, sorry, yes, Sclater, but that's because of just merging uh, species that they thought uh, weren't separate. 
And in this field guide, it's the first time that every single species was illustrated. So even Shelley had included a lot of plates, but not for every single species. Um, Sclater didn't have any plates at all, just two volumes of taxonomy. So this is the first time. So the, the pictures are very small, uh, but they were all painted. And um, so uh, and also using modern photographic uh, copying techniques by now. The, uh, Grant had described the fox's weaver, so before uh, these publications, but uh, this person is the author of uh, fox's weaver. And this was the first time a, a picture had appeared was in these volumes for the one for East Africa. The fox's weaver is a very poorly known species. It's the only endemic bird of any birds uh, to Uganda. So it's the only bird in Uganda that only occurs uh, in that country. It's found in marshes. It's very, very similar. So here you see it uh, illustrated on these stamps. Uh, very similar in appearance to speaks weaver, but separated speaks weaver don't have a map here, but it occurs uh, over here into Somaliland. And uh, the males uh, in breeding plumage resemble each other, and the females in, uh, also resemble each other. But uh, the, the fox's weaver is darker uh, just because the edges of the uh, yellow are more narrow than here, so it makes it appear darker. And as I said, they prefer swamps rather than savanna, uh, speaks weaver. So there have been recent expeditions in Uganda to look for this bird, and people are struggling to find it. Uh, it's just been recorded in a few within this area at a few different wetlands that are not always that easy to access. Um, but because also they build their nests in the swamps, the nest has been described, uh, but only once or twice. Uh, it's just very hard to get deep into the swamp areas to find these birds. But certainly the um, thought is still that it is definitely a separate species to speak Sweden. Right, then this is uh, not quite an African uh, series of volumes, but important to talk about now. Uh, and that is Peter's checklist of all the birds of the world. Again, no illustrations just uh, taxonomic work, uh, 16 volumes, but it's covering all the birds of the world known at the time. And uh, so here, 116 weavers were described, getting very close to the number of 117 weavers that I've been quoting over the course of this week, and I'll come to why I say there are 117 weavers. No new ones. But there were, so Peter's actually, I can't remember when he passed away, but before the end of the series, and he certainly had many uh, correspondents helping him. And the weavers were actually written up by um, Moreau, an English ornithologist working in East Africa, mainly Tanzania. And so he did the weaver series completely uh, in this work uh, of Peter's. Uh, Moreau collected uh, only one weaver bird species, but he wrote extensively on bird migration and different birds and incredibly knowledgeable. And one of the um, more recent uh, ornithological experts in Africa. So this is the bird that he did describe. And interestingly enough, he had seen it uh, for uh, in his garden uh, many times. And just interestingly, he wrote, uh, we have just got a weaver here, which beats me completely. And this is an expert in, in ornithology, but of course it was just a new species. The bird was the male of a pair that looked alike, and it was obtained just outside my office at the edge of the forest. We have seen this bird uh, perhaps, oh, sorry, that's half a dozen times in the three years we've been here and always been puzzled by it. So he'd been observing it for three years. It's outside his office, and I don't know why he never went out and, and shot a specimen, uh, but uh, he eventually sent his native um, tracker to go and collect a specimen, and he did. And so when he obtained the specimen, he sent it off uh, to England, where Sclater described it as a new species, separate to the very similar olive-headed weaver. So um, just to show the, uh, where it occurs, so this is where 
uh, the blue patch is where um, it was collected. That's where uh, Moreau was at the time. And these different colors just illustrate the different mountain peaks uh, where the species occurs. There are no subspecies, it's all the same. Uh, but they only occur in forest on, in montane areas, so very high up altitude, um, but where there's still forest on these East African Arc Mountains. And the uh, light green is where it's the most common. So although in this area, it's also it's not uh, too uncommon. Unfortunately, uh, there are not that many individuals left. It's been estimated recently by IUCN that there are only 2,500 individuals, and it's declining, largely because uh, people are busy cutting forests down as they're going up the mountainside and things like that. Just incidentally, it's very strange that the Palestinians would illustrate an African bird on their stamp, uh, but yeah, people, I guess, People are always just looking for colorful birds to put on stamps, no matter which country they are in. Right, then, uh, very recently, or recently relative to the time scale of uh, my, my course, um, a whole bunch of different editors, uh, starting with the famous um, uh, raptor ornithologist, Leslie Brown, but also Fry and Keith, um, uh, wrote this handbook of birds of Africa. Incredible series uh, detailing as much biology as possible and um, being as up to date as possible. So again was uh, over nearly two, well, two decades, uh, eight volumes, although the last volume uh, is the um, Indian Ocean Islands and there was quite a gap. So the series of the first seven volumes had been done in succession and there was a large gap when they decided to, when the funding was uh, made available for uh, producing the Indian Ocean Guide as well. So this covered 104 uh, weavers uh, simply because they didn't include the um, Asian species and also a lot more lumping again. Uh, than previous authors, but also uh, then the, the Fodi species um, on the Indian Ocean Islands and Sakalava weaver, Nelly Corby's weaver from Madagascar were included there. And for the first time in this volume, since early days, the Aldabra Fodi was split off again, and I'll just explain that. So the Aldabra Fodi was uh, first described by an American Dr. Abbott visiting uh, Aldabra Island. Aldabra Island is, an, is on high up on my bucket list of places to visit. I've always just been fascinated by it. I've been to a lot of uh, islands in the Seychelles, and Aldabra belongs to the Seychelles Islands, but it's very far away. Uh, so it's uh, politically part of the Seychelles, but uh, geographically it's quite far away. But also it's very hard to get there, or rather very expensive, uh, unless you've got your own private yacht, I guess. There is a, a research uh, a facility there, and there are people living there uh, permanently, uh, teams of people studying the coral reefs and, and the other wildlife, but mainly the marine life. Nevertheless, um, after it had been, uh, the Aldabra Fodi had been described, it looks very similar to the Comoro Fodi, which is in the Comor Islands. And, and these, so, he, so it was sent to America where this guy, American ornithologist uh, Ridgway, described it. And Shelley and Sclater still considered it a separate species on its own. But then uh, in this uh, Peters series, uh, edited, whoops, sorry, edited by, that's why I've just put Mayer, Ernst Mayer, a very famous taxonomist, um, uh, was the author of the later uh, series once uh, Peters had passed away. But still, this is basically Moreau who decided uh, to make it a, a subspecies of the Comor Fodi. And all the field guides and books uh, since then, uh, since the 60s, have all said the same until um, back here very recently in 2013, 
it was separated out as a uh, species on its own again. And that's partly because of some genetic work that was done on the Fodes, proving that it really is a separate species, no matter how similar it may look uh, to, to this uh, Comor Fodi. Right, then, um, I don't know if you know about this series, Handbook of Birds of the World. Again, not an African series, but uh, probably one of the most outstanding uh, bird volumes ever published. And it covers every single bird species in the world. Now, it does not have very much information uh, in one sense about each species, but they've got incredibly good family accounts. So it will talk about the weavers as a family, the whole biology and different aspects, and then uh, just have an illustration for every species, as well as a very short note just on that species, uh, just a um, uh, uh, paragraph or so, really. And here, because the uh, Aldabra fodi has had now been split. It also was considered here as a separate species. So 117 weaver bird species. Uh, that's what I'd been working on a long time ago, even before the Aldabra fodi was split officially. I'd considered it a separate species, and that's the number I've been working on. I'll have to possibly uh, change that in future, uh, uh, which we'll come to uh, tomorrow. So, and in fact, in the next slide. So since uh, this series was published and the Weaver uh, volume was in 2010, incidentally, uh, there's 17 volumes, but there were 16 normal volumes. The 17th was a special edition with new species that had been described since the start of the series. So, uh, you know, in 1992, the first series got the ostrich and the other flightless birds, and it goes into the um, albatrosses, etc. Uh, but by the time um, uh, 2013 came along, some new birds had been described since 1992 in the, the earlier groups of birds. And so this volume is a whole volume just on all the new species, as well as taxonomic changes where there were splits uh, in, uh, from subspecies or lumping and things like that. So what you realize is that it's not constant. Uh, the number of bird species keeps changing every year as new uh, research is being done. And now, more recently, in 2014, the uh, non-passerines and 2016 passerines uh, checklist uh, was uh, published. Uh, by Del Hoyo, so it's the same guy who did this series, uh, but working together with BirdLife International, and they did an illustrated checklist summary. So what they did was, it's just a map, a small picture of every bird with a, just a very short line on each species, so that it's uh, compressed into two volumes, those 17 volumes down to two volumes. Much more affordable. Uh, you have to sell your house if you want to buy the, the previous whole set, just about, um, because of the exchange rate uh, uh, from Europe. But in this uh, series, what happened is there are now 124 species. Just in two or three years' time, suddenly uh, people decided that uh, there are a lot more species. But that's a whole different story that I want to talk about tomorrow, uh, about the whole naming and taxonomy changes uh, and things like that. So there are eight new species, but it's not new birds that have been, new weavers that have been found in the field, it's just the way that they've been split. So taking the red-headed weaver and saying it's actually three species instead of one. And the same apply, principle applies to, to a lot of the other birds. So here, uh, Today's talk was a bit different in that I was talking more specifically about artists and authors, but in this time period, and I've mentioned a few weavers here and there, but already you can see from the other time periods, a lot less new species uh, have been, were found for the first time in the field and described. Uh, but still, it's not nothing. It's, it's still continuing on to, till today. All right, that's the end of today's talk. Oh, sorry, it's a bit earlier than I expected, but so there's time for questions or discussion or comments or anything.
Yeah, that's fine because that's still even a swallow. If, I mean, it was, a swallow was obviously first found in Europe. In fact, most of the migrants would have been found in Europe first, just because that's where people were collecting uh, before Linnaeus already, and the birds were known. But a migrant coming to here, I mean, it belongs to South Africa just as much as Europe. And so, even if a migrant's first found in South Africa or Africa somewhere, it's still part of its range, even if it doesn't breed here. And so it's still valid. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. It's a challenge, of course, because bird distributions are changing and vagrants appear anywhere. I mean, it's amazing how the uh, field guides for South Africa keep getting longer and longer every year because there's a new vagrant that's appeared. Of course, there may be some vagrants that uh, appear once or twice and never again. Others you just get every few years. Um, about two years ago, I was doing some bird ringing in um, Princess Flay, and I caught a warbler. There are three warbler species, uh, the uh, African reed warbler, which migrates to Central Africa and back, and the um, lesser swamp warbler, which is a resident, as well as the little rush warbler, which is also a resident. But I caught this warbler, and I immediately knew this is not one of those three. And when I looked at it more carefully, I thought, ah, oh, I think it's a garden warbler. But I got my book out, and indeed, it was a garden warbler. Garden warblers migrate to South Africa every year. I mean, they're very common up country, but it was only the fourth record for the Western Cape. And, you know, when I went back and delved and spoke to Trevor Hardacre and so on. So, yeah, but I mean, as you say, the, the American skimmer, uh, the uh, there was also that uh, little, not little egret, some egrets, I uh, can't remember the name, that appeared here. So, uh, yeah, sorry? Snowy. Snowy egret, thank you, that's it. Yes. 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 Another point, though, of course, is that people are looking out for birds more and more. So there may have been vagrants 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, but they were just missed and no one was seeing them. There are more and more bird watchers every year. Uh, it's such a popular hobby. And so there's more people looking. And they're getting better at their um, identification skills. So it's not just saying, oh, it's another little egret. You know, people are looking and saying, but wait a minute, that bull color looks wrong. And um, then noticing that actually it's a different species and then finding out what it is. Sometimes people get it wrong. I know, I know that Trevor Hardacre has sometimes had to send apologies and said, there's this bird. Uh, there was recently an example. I can't remember which one, though. And then he had to retract it and say, sorry, it's been identified as just one of our normal birds. Uh, of course, birds can have aberrant plumage, plumages or things like that. So it's... Um, well, yeah, one has to be careful. But the amazing thing is also nowadays people have cameras and with a camera you can take a nice photo, it can be studied. So even if the birds disappeared or you didn't get a good view, uh, you know, you can really study it very nicely afterwards. Oh. So are any, is anyone here a twitcher or just normal bird watcher? You're a twitcher. Oh, wow, okay. Um, I've got a copy of the Black Eagle book. It's absolutely amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so you helped her, I guess? She came up once. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, she started that study many years ago. Yeah. No, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Or? Yes. Mm. I, I get them in my garden a lot, but I, uh, I don't see any nests around. Okay, which yeah. suburb do you live in? In Constantia. Constantia, okay. It's interesting, I'll answer your question but um, uh, in a moment, but it's interesting that Cape weavers used to breed in Kirstenbosch. When I was a student at UCT, and that's something like 30 years ago, I would go to Kirstenbosch regularly, just about every weekend, uh, to uh, look for colouringed Cape sugar birds, um, but I'd also enjoy birding, and I saw these Cape weavers nesting at the pond and also where the botanical um, 
society, library or offices are. In the palm trees there, they were breeding. As well as Ardern Gardens, they were breeding there. But while I was a student, I noticed the number of nests declining every year at both places. And, and then when I came to visit, you know, I then went to work in Pretoria after my studies. Uh, but when I visited Cape Town, I saw they'd gone. And even now, when I check every now and then, they've gone. So the dis it's a very small range change, but it's just moved away from there, and they just don't visit there anymore. They certainly, I mean, they visit. They still fly around, and so you can see them in Constantia. Um, I've got a colleague, Mike Picker, who lives in Constantia, and he says he's got southern mast weavers breeding on his plot, uh, his property, but not cape weavers. So why, I'm not sure, but they, I know that they're very common in pinelands in particular. Now, I once plotted all the different colonies, and I saw that they're all within, I think, 200 meters of the river. And, um, but even though they, you can't see the river from where the colonies are because there's gardens everywhere. But if you look on a map, it's like amazing how close it is. So uh, historically, they would have been breeding along the river, and now they've moved into the gardens. But they are certainly clumped in the sense that there are spots where they, they like not just having a colony, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, coming to the, you know, talking about the nesting and so on, but they, they like colonies, but also a grouping of colonies, like a village where you know, there's a colony here, here's one here, they can fly between, and so on, hotspots. And so if for some reason one of the colonies decreases, just too many of the males die and aren't being replaced, then the others say, whoa, I don't know if I want to be here. And that's what I think happened in Kirstenbosch. It, just because it decreased, it's a, a you know, catch-22 situation. The others say, I don't want to be here either. And they just start moving away, and eventually there's none. One day it could happen that a few young males decide to start building there again and attract more and more, and it starts up again. It may fizzle or it may not. It just depends. Um, but certainly, cape weavers are polygonous, so they, one male tries to attract lots of females. Um, and some males are very successful and will attract a lot. Others will not. Uh, it just depends on small size or color variations, how well they build the nest, and so on. Uh, the males usually don't help, well, they don't help with the incubation at all. So the female does all the incubating, sitting on the eggs. The female does all the feeding of the chicks, except males sometimes help. I've not had time to study it in detail, uh, so we don't, although I have noticed just casually that often it's nearer the end of the breeding season that males help a bit more. Certainly if a female had was feeding chicks and then something happened to her, a predator kills the female or something else happens, the male would continue uh, feeding the chicks and just take over a greater, uh, well, do it completely then. Um, so as I mentioned in one of my talks, the cape weavers, they are around the colonies in uh, the breeding time, but they move and forage very far in winter. They've been known to fly all the way down to Cape Point Although, again, interestingly enough, they have bred at the restaurant in Cape Point, but that was in the 1960s, I think. And uh, I don't know if there have been any breeding records since then, although they, they, still visit to, uh, they still visit. And they'll visit the farmlands and they fly all over. So you, did you say you do see them in, in Constantia? Yeah, but not breeding, yeah. So, and of course, even in summer, they may visit. It could be young birds. It could also be colonies from not too far away. I mean, the birds wouldn't move too far from the breeding site while they're breeding, but the young birds the bir and the birds that didn't, you know, uh, males that are one year old can't breed. Uh, they don't uh, have the skills to build the nest as well as an adult male. So they'll try. They build nests, but they're very... Um, bad examples, and the females just don't accept them. So you could be seeing uh, birds that aren't actively breeding. Uh, in winter, you could be seeing anything, adult males, because they're not breeding then, or females. Um, I don't know if you've noticed a difference between summer and winter, or not really. Uh, no, no, yeah. 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 Uh, in 2006, I drove around the peninsula and I monitor, I try to find as many weaver colonies as possible. I also put adverts in the 
Cape Bird Club, newspapers. I had loads of people responding and saying, oh, I've got one a colony in my garden. And I visited many of them. I couldn't visit all of them, but I plotted them all. And that's why I know that in Constantia there are less colonies. Of course, things can change since 2006, um, but not far from there. I mean, the southern suburb wetlands have got loads of colonies. So around Princess Flay, Mocker River, Rhonda Flay, Strandfontein, all over. Um, and historically, they would have been around these wetlands breeding in the reeds. They, of course, love um, exotic trees, especially uh, gum trees as well as pine trees. I mean, on Robben Island, there are a lot of colonies, and they're all in only exotic trees um, uh, around the island. But they moved there in historic times because Van Riebeck's time, there were no trees on Robben Island. Uh, so they would have flown across at some point and established themselves there. There's still a little bit of movement between, uh, from Robben Island to the mainland because we've had one or two uh, ring birds that have moved either one way or the other. Um, but it looks like the, you know, a lot of the individuals will never leave uh, Robben Island. They'll just grow there, grow up there, live there, and die there. But every now and then an individual will move back or one from the mainland will move there. Uh, I, the, something else I can tell you about the breeding biology, the eggs of the Cape Weaver are always blue. Uh, whereas in some weavers have different colored eggs. One female will have blue eggs, another female blue eggs with brown spots, another one white eggs, another one with white with brown spots. But the cape weaver, only blue. It is parasitized by the Deidre cuckoo occasionally, but interestingly enough, and this is something I'm also trying to research, not in the Western Cape. So I found... Um, Deidre cuckoos in southernmost weaver nests in Pretoria and other places. Um, but there they also use the Cape weavers. But in Cape Town, it looks like the Deidre cuckoo, which is not very common. I mean, it, it's, you hear them occasionally. They're quite scarce here. But I suspect they only ne uh, uh, lay the eggs in sparrow nests, whereas the rest of the country, they'll choose sparrow, weaver, bishop nests to breed in. So... Um, but the Cape Weaver is not one of the main hosts. I mean, it is parasitized elsewhere sometimes, but it's not one of the main hosts. So we think that Deidre cuckoos that um, specialize on some birds will, those birds sometimes evolve strategies by changing the egg color so that it's harder for the cuckoo to match. Uh, so that's a whole fascinating story on its own. But it looks like the Cape Weaver has never been a main host because it's got plain blue eggs and... Um, hasn't evolved any color variation. I don't know if you've got more questions about uh, their breeding biology or anything else. Yes, sir, so the last week I just saw those recently in my garden. Okay. Yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Is the evidence wow. that they're increasing? Yes. Yes. Um, they first arrived on the peninsula in, the first record was 1961 or so at Rondeflay where Ernst Middlemas was monitoring birds on a virtually daily basis. And so he plotted over a few years from 1961. Within a few years, by 1970, he was seeing them 100% of the time. They were there just about all the time. So they'd increased just in a few years very dramatically. Um, the first records in the Western Cape are from 1910 or so, but not Cape Town. Just gradually they expanded their range. So historically, the earliest writers, so Layard, before 1900, wrote that it occurs from Port Elizabeth across around the Karoo all the way to uh, the Orange River and northwards. So it, it occurred historically in Namibia, uh, Eastern Cape, Free State, etc., but not the Western Cape or large part of the Northern Cape. And so, as I say, it's expanded its range. I've studied this. I haven't written it up properly yet. But from the Eastern Cape towards Cape Town and then northwards towards Springbuck. Um, but even now, still, I think that it's increasing all the time. And uh, partly, I think, because of competition with the Cape Weaver, it's been slow but ongoing. So it's just like inching its way in. Another thing I've noticed in uh, studying nest sites is 
If you look at the nest sites that are chosen by the masked weaver in southern Africa, it's a much higher rate of trees. They'll use bamboos and reeds, but 70% of the time they prefer trees, whereas just in the southwestern Cape, they use 70% of the time reeds and less trees. And I think, and with Cape Weaver, it's mostly just trees, but also reeds. Even in Cape Town, I know places where they're in the reeds. But I think the moss weaver is getting its way in, uh, in this competition with the Cape Weaver by nesting mostly in reeds. And then where there's an opportunity, it'll go into gardens and nest in trees as well. But yeah, I won't be surprised if in a few years' time you'll have them breeding on your, in your property if they're suitable sites. Because um, as I say, Mike Picker said they weren't there a few years ago and now he's got them breeding on his plot. Uh, and I've just seen it as well everywhere. It's very gradual, but the southern moss weaver is becoming more common. I don't think they'll ever replace the cape weaver, but it's just getting in and competing on an equal uh, footing, really, I think. Well, it's signaling is what I mentioned, and what that means is just so that uh, it, uh, it's partly identification. So female, uh, of the, especially the weavers, they're all pretty much dull, mostly, not, not all. Spectacle weaver isn't, and so on. And so it makes it easier to recognize. And so even here in the Western Cape, although mast weavers didn't occur here, they're parts of the country where they both occur. A female can see, ah, oh, that's a cape weaver. Very easy because of the, the very clear white eye uh, compared to a southern masked weaver male, which has got a red eye and a black mask. But you know, and it's also the contrast. So if, it's not something I've studied, but as I said, Adrian Craig has been uh, studying the eye colour and hasn't come to a conclusion yet. But sort of like this idea of that there's, the weavers want to have a contrast between the eye colour and the face colour. Um, it doesn't work perfectly, but there's something there and needs further investigation. What I've noticed with catching cape weavers and ringing them is that younger males have a whiter eye and then older males have a more pinkish eye, white pink. Now, the, it's easy for that to happen biologically. It's just blood in the blood vessels. But why they want that, or how does, you know, do, is it... Um, a uh, mark of age and experience, maybe, I don't know. That's where one would have to do a more detailed study. And so possibly a female could recognize that and say, ha, oh, that's an experienced male, it's got a more pink eye. Um, how, why a younger male wouldn't try and copy that, I don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So there's still so much we don't know. I mean, people can study one aspect of biology for decades and discover amazing things. But then there's still so many other things to study and learn. So, yeah, but it keeps us busy. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, thanks, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow.